My name is Kent Bai. I do the Voices of VR podcast, and I'm going to be talking about a number of different topics today, experiential design, context, process, world building, and design trade-offs. So whenever I give talks like this, I kind of like to digest a lot of new information. And so I've been really digging a lot more into Alfred North Whitehead's uh, process philosophy, the ideas of world building, and then context comes up a lot, both in world building as well as in ethics, which I sent over just a brief uh, video about ethics. I've done a whole XR ethics manifesto as well. I'm not going to be diving specifically too much into the ethics uh, because that's sort of, uh, I've got other talks and I'll be, all the, the ways in which I'll be talking about context will be focusing specifically on world building. So, okay, here we go. So I started the Voices VR back in uh, May of 2014. And at this point I've recorded probably around 1600 different interviews, published uh, 981 of them. Um, and yeah, just have been capturing this real time oral history over the last seven years, uh, just tracing the evolution of the medium as it unfolds. Uh, so uh, I've been getting into Alfred North Whitehead and as a philosopher, he has this saying of uh, seek simplicity and distrust it. And you know, he was somebody who actually tried to with Bertrand Russell turn all of mathematics into logic. And that ended up failing because Girdle came up with the incompleteness theorem saying that any attempt to try to like uh, synthesize something down into its uh, like a one massive logical system, it's going to be one of two things. It's either going to be consistent or complete. So uh, any attempt that uh, tries to do this comprehensive framework is inherently going to be incomplete. So as much as I am going out on a limb and trying to uh, put forth these different frameworks, know that they have certain utility, but they have certain ways in which they, they can't reveal certain aspects of reality, which means that you kind of have to layer uh, framework on top of framework on, on top of framework, just depending on what you're doing. So that's just a, a good starting point to seek simplicity and to distrust it. So that's what I'll be uh, aiming for today. All right, so here's the agenda for today. I'm gonna be, first of all, talking about the uh, four aspects of um, what I, of experiential design, uh, both quality, context, character, and story, but mixed in there, I'm also gonna be talking about dialectics and polarities, and then fusing together different design disciplines. Uh, and then I'll be diving in a little bit into the technological architecture and the evolution of technology. And then finally, uh, kind of ending up with some uh, design trade-offs. So the when I go to different uh, virtual reality experiences, I tend to classify them into like four different ca uh, categories. It's the quality of the experience, the context of the experience, the character of the experience, and the story of the experience. So I'll be breaking down what I mean by that, um, but it helps me not only to kind of categorize the experience in my own mind and remember what I experienced, but also facilitate conversations. Because I find have, uh, forcing myself to experience something and then talk about it has changed the way that I experience it because I have to put language to it and be able to articulate what I'm experiencing. I think that generally is what a lot of this experiential de design is all about, is for you to go have a phenomenological experience and then to be able to put language to what you just experienced. But then uh, because everybody, other people can also have that experience kind of for the first time that we're we'll able to democratize that, you're able to start to calibrate your own experience uh, relative to other people that are also having those experiences. So just like any other media or piece of art. All right, so uh, the four qualities of presence that I'll be talking about here are the active presence, the mental and social presence, the embodied and environmental presence, as well as the emotional presence. So uh, to, a good metaphor to kind of make sense of these different qualities of presence is if you kind of think about like the uh, communicate the, you know, the video games for active presence where you're expressing your agency, you're, you're really taking ad action, expressing your will, moving around, locomoting. Uh, so you're, you're exerting your will into the experience in some fashion. And, and video games are kind of like the paradigmatic example of active presence. And then you have mental and social presence, which you have literature and any abstractions of language. You have uh, your phone to be able to communicate with other people, social networking. You have like podcasting, you know, speaking to each other, as well as just uh, the internet and being able to consume information. And so this is all about uh, ways in which that we're able to communicate through the abstractions of language, uh, not only with making uh, mental models of the world so that we make sure that what we're seeing is plausible and that we believe it and it's what we expect. Uh, but it's also ways in which that we can connect to other people as well and be able to use the affordances of language to be able to uh, talk to people. 
Uh, and web design is a big uh, aspect of that uh, in terms of the mental and social presence. So then you have the emotional presence and that's the cinematic storytelling of film. So you have both the, the music uh, and the lighting and the film editing and the rhythm and the pacing. Uh, a film is essentially building and releasing tension. It's like cycling through these consonants and dissonant cycles. And what it's doing is it's trying to build tension and release it, meaning that it's sort of building up um, you know, narrative tension and then releasing it so that you, uh, you feel like you've gone on a journey. So it gives you a real sense of time. Uh, and then you have the embodied and environmental presence. This is everything from theater and architecture and dance and spatialized audio and all of our sensory experiences of uh, our hearing, our, our sight, our touch, our smells, uh, um, our haptics. Uh, so all these are, you know, for the first time, we're able to kind of digitally synthesize uh, input to these uh, through virtual and augmented reality. But there's lots of other existing spatialized mediums for everything from architecture to theater. So the my big point, uh, I guess, for virtual reality is that you're taking all of these existing communications mediums and you're kind of mashing them all together. And I think that's the challenge of experiential design is that you have to take these different design disciplines that inherently are conflicting with each other in different ways. And you have to figure out what's new. And one big thing that's new within VR is the sense of presence, the, the feeling that you're actually gone to another place, that it's plausible, that it's real, that you are able to exert your will into the experience and you, it, you're able to, to see it interact and respond to you in some fashion. So it's blending everything from the video games to the user interaction design and um, you know, so it's all these designs, this one's game design, web design, narrative design, uh, you know, audio design, uh, sound design, cinematic filmmaking, uh, and lighting, and uh, also the, <clears throat> all the theater, architecture, dance, embodiment, uh, all these things are, are all being pushed together. So you have intuition, thinking, feeling, and sensing. These are connected to the different uh, I guess uh, these elements, the earth, air, fire, and water, and this is the Jungian interpretation. So, you know, your intuitive aspects, your thinking aspects, the feeling aspects, and sensing aspects. So it's another access into these different qualities of presence. Uh, so you have the, the making choices and taking action of the mental and social presence and the active presence, and then you have the uh, more receptive emotional immersion and the sensory experience. So uh, another I guess uh, analogic metaphor that I like to pull in at this point is the yang and the yin from Chinese philosophy. The yang is the energy that's going outward, it's the sun, and then the yin is the more receptive, uh, it's the night. Um, and so if we look back here, these top two of the fire and the air are the more yang, and then the earth and the water are the more yin. Uh, so the yin, the, the yang is more outward and the yin is more inward. Uh, you have the yang being more giving, the yin being more receiving. Yang being more about talking, Yin more about listening. So you could see that there's like these series of different dialectical relationships, everything from day, night, moon, sun, summer, winter, um, you know, giving, receiving, hot, cold, uh, you know, your individualized self versus connected to the whole. So part of the reason why I'm so drawn to Chinese philosophy is because these metaphors are so uh, concrete and easy to kind of intuitively grasp. And I'll be getting into the dialectics here in the, the next section, but I just wanted to sort of pull this out in the sense that, um, you know, these, uh, the, the yang and the yin are, uh, you, you never have a day that's completely yang and it, or a day that's completely yin. You have days that they're equal in the solstices and you have days that they're maximized in those, in the, or in the, uh, they're equal on the equinoxes and they're, you know, uh, maximized on the solstices, but uh, they're always in flux from day to day. It's moving from, one dynamic state to the next. And so that's another, um, I guess, uh, philosophical point, which is that um, the Chinese philosophy has this basis of, of that the under, underlying nature of reality is this dynamic flux that's constantly changing. Uh, and that's a lot of where, uh, you know, Alfred North Whitehead and his process philosophy also has that, which is in contrast to say substance metaphysics of Western philosophy. And that's important just because as we think about experiential design, it's all about processes that are unfolding. It's about an experience that has a beginning, middle, and end. Um, and so, you know, a, a lot of the existing philosophical frameworks tend to treat time as like a spatialized dimension or uh, something that's a property of these physical objects. Um, but I think there's, a, there's enough sort of uh, 
you can you can be justified enough to sort of make it a whole other metaphysical argument that the basis of reality are these processes or experience itself. But you don't you don't have to sort of adopt that metaphysical assumption. You could still, but I I happen to just because I think it's helpful to help understand the nature of virtual reality. So again, active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. Again, all four of these are all happening all at the same time, and any experience is kind of modulating uh, these, uh, you know, uh, to what combination that you have, and that's uh, the, the qualitative dimension of experiential design. So Aristotle. Uh, talked about these two different polarities of uh, both the hot, the cold, the wet, and the dry. Uh, and so you can map this uh, out. So you can see fire here is hot and dry, earth is dry and cold, water is cold and wet, and air is wet and hot. And so you have these two dialectical polarities that they're combined like this so that you have the, the four elements that, you know, at, back in the ancient Greeks, they thought that that was kind of the basis of reality. You know, since then we've discussed, well, I... <laughs> I guess you could uh, argue that you know Aristotle said that the nature of reality are these substances, uh, and if we go back to say like Alfred North Whitehead or Chinese philosophy, the basis of reality uh, may actually not be substance; it may be these dynamic uh, processes. If you look at quantum mechanics, then you could see that there's these potentials that are discrete, and it's not like this continuous substances that we tend to think of, um, you know, with these metric systems. So. Again, you have these two dialectics of hot, cold, wet, and dry that have the four elements of, of fire, air, earth, and water. So you can also think about the hot and cold as sort of going, giving outward uh, and then receiving inward, and then the uh, dry as individuating and the wet as bonding. You can think of what happens when you put uh, water into uh, like the earth. It starts to you know come together and bond, but earth on its own is sort of more individuating. So Kind of an archetypal representation is like you're sitting there having your own individual embodied experience. You're kind of like meditating, and you're having your own um, sensory experience that you're really paying attention to your own phenomenolog phenomenology. And then the the more active presence is that you are expressing your will and your agency in some way, but you are you're less receptive of say receiving a story. You're expressing your will, but when you're deciding what to how to engage with your will, it becomes then difficult to fully receive. This is sort of the existential tension between um, you know, storytelling uh, and interactive narratives, because it's hard to talk and listen at the same time. Uh, you can't do it. You, have, you just have to context switch. If you go over here to sort of the emotional uh, presence, it's sort of like the, uh, you know, you, you really tapped into your emotions and it could be connecting because you're really kind of in this empathetic field. So when you watch a movie, it's all about empathizing with other people's experiences. Uh, and then the, the uh, social and mental and social is all about, you know, you're actively communicating and connecting to other people. So you're, you're both going outward and bonding with other folks. Okay. So finally, this, uh, this, uh, again, sort of a recap is the different, you know, uh, game design is the hot and dry, the, uh, you know, the different aspects of uh, narrative design and, um, uh, web design and, uh, podcasts and web, web apps and, uh, social media in general. Uh, and then the, that's the mental social presence and then the emotional presence and then the uh, embodied presence. Okay. So uh, just, just to wrap up this section here, I wanted to say a few words about this uh, predictive coding theory of neuroscience. And the reason is because uh, the way that our brains work is that you experience life through these embodied experiences, and then you create these heuristics, these mental models. And then you, as you go through the world, sensing the world, then you kind of match what your sensory experience is based upon these models that you have in your mind. And so you have these sensory experiences and these mental models of reality. Uh, so you can think of this as your direct sort of uh, embodied experiences uh, with sort of the, the mental models that you have. And that when they're wrong, then you try to correct them. Uh, and there's sort of dopamine that's released in order to have more and more accurate models of reality. So in, in some ways, it's kind of like the theory and practice where you go through life, you're living life, you're having these embodied experiences, and then you come up with these mental models and simulations in your mind that are kind of a, a, a theory of what the world is like. So there's a book called How We Learn that sort of goes through these different phases of you're paying attention, you're taking all the sensory input, you're actively engaging with that information, and then you're kind of comparing it with your existing models. And if there is error, then you take those errors 
and then you try to correct that uh, so that you have even more accurate models. And then you, uh, when you're sleeping, you kind of consolidate all that information. So you have this kind of process loop. Our, our perception or consciousness is kind of in this unfolding process. Okay, so again, you have these sensory experiences of reality and the concepts of reality. Um, and you have different ways in which you kind of interrogate it, you explore, create. Uh, and these, these kind of roughly match up to the elements as well. Although, you know, I'd say it's, it's kind of like a more category theoretical uh, in the sense that it's uh, just a, a, an unfolding process here. Uh, the, the elements themselves don't have any inherent uh, uh, sort of cyclical nature, uh, at least in this, uh, this um, order uh, that it's in right now. Okay, so uh, I'm actually gonna pause and see if there are any questions up to this point, and then I'll sort of go on to the, uh, the next sections. I was just wondering, Ken, if you can talk about, um, you know, as we're looking at embodied experiences, what, do do you see a clear distinction, or where do you draw a, a line between, um, I guess, what we would call like traditional embodied experiences versus like digitally mediated embodied experiences, like virtual and augmented reality or other kind of technology-assisted uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, the, the virtual and the real, in some sense, um, it, it actually has more, I'd, I'd say, to do with the difference between substance metaphysics and process relational metaphysics. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we call it virtual reality because it's, it's quote unquote, not real, but you can have experiences that feel just as real, uh, even though they're from a simulation, uh, but you can have these social interactions and experiences that for memories that are just as salient as any other experience. So uh, for me, there is there are going to be things that you can only do in reality. Let's say be with a bunch of people and have emergent haptic interactions with other people in the same co-located place. Uh, so there are going to be uh, hard limits in terms of you know smell, taste, touch. Um, up until if we can do sort of direct neural stimulation. Um, but I would argue that uh, to some extent, the way that um, embodied cognition works is that um, you're kind of referencing your existing experiences. And so if you were to like grow up in a vat and have no embodied experiences, then it'd be hard to say how effective virtual reality is because it's, it's, it's trying to simulate these things that we already have these direct embodied experiences of in our life. And so it's, you know, the very nature of it is that we are going to have these repositories of these um, experiences. A, a, an example that I, I hear neuroscientists say a lot is like, when I say the word kick, then uh, there's actually the part of your motor cortex of your brain that's, that controls your foot moving that gets activated when I speak the language. So there's ways in which that our whole brain is activated based upon our previous embodied experiences uh, by having these embodied experiences in real life. And there are uh, folks like George Lakoff and others who argue that you absolutely need that sort of baseline of those embodied experiences in order to kind of, you know, uh, make sense of a lot of life. Although there's folks that have uh, disabilities and accessibility issues, and so they may have less sort of of a full spectrum of a uh, of that experience, but they may just have a a more deeper experience of other realms as well. I mean, their sense of uh, hearing or sight may be amplified because of the they're compensating in some ways. So yeah, that's just a, uh, you know, but I think it actually, that question kind of gets to the heart of what's reality. And if you say reality is experience, which is what Whitehead says, he says that the fundamental nature of reality is experience. Then if that's true, then, you know, you start, you start to stop making these kind of arbitrary differentiations that can create like a hierarchy of value, uh, saying that uh, having experiences in the real world are more valuable because it has these ad ad additional fidelity. Um, so I, I kind of resist that um, hierarchy, although it does exist. Um, so yeah, anyway, that's some thoughts. So the dialectics and polarities. Um, so, uh, so this is a, an example of a polarity here, which is, um, you know, the spectrum of, of story authorship, where on one end you have authored narrative, and then the other end you have a generative narrative. Um, and so when you watch a film, uh, unless you're watching something like Bandersnatch on Netflix, where you are making choices, but most films, you don't have any sort of input. 
you're just watching it and no matter what you do, it's going to be the same film for you and everybody else that watches it. And so it's basically a, a, a fixed artifact that's immutable, uh, you know, with some exceptions of director's cuts and, you know, different versions and iterations. But for the most part, once it's done and, and put out into the world, then you pretty much have the same experience, which is not the same that you, thing you could say for, say, like a video game, which could have any number of different branching aspects where um, it becomes more about you uh, exploring your own agency and making choices than it does about, say, a, a fixed story that um, the director is telling. The, the fixed story has like a time-based constraint of building and releasing tension. And, you know, film is able to really optimize what you can do with having complete control over that building and releasing of that tension. And whenever you get into the interactive games, then the the directors have to give up a little bit of their own control over how they're going to control the um, that unfolding of that story because all now all of a sudden the player has the control to be able to do whatever they want and if they don't want to pay attention then they don't ha necessarily have to. So uh, this is one example of a dialectic of where uh, on one end you have complete control of well uh, as much control as a director can have in the process of collaborating with a lot of people to make a film. Uh, as opposed to that same collaborative process with a bunch of people in an interactive. But uh, the difference is the degree of uh, what the user can do to be able to modulate their own experience. So going back to the yang and the yin, and kind of looking at these different dialectics of uh, sunny, shady, sun, moon, day, night. Um, and I wanted to kind of unpack just the, I guess, the the natural philosophy and celestial mechanics of the, this sort of yin yang symbol and the nature of yin and yang, because I think it's helpful to think about uh, process and processes that are unfolding. So if we look at over the course of the day, uh, this would be sort of if you take the eastern horizon and this would be the western horizon and it sort of, uh, and this would be south and this would be north if you're in the northern hemisphere. So the sun would rise uh, in the morning and then uh, in the midday, it would be uh, the, the southern uh, meridian. Uh, and that's the yang growing, and then the yang withers, and then the sun sets, and then then the yin is starting to, to grow, and then the yin withers, and then you have this cycle that goes over the course of the day. And you can kind of see that this is the path of the ecliptic of the sun if it was spread out, and it kind of forms this yin-yang symbol. Um, and so that's over the course of the day, but what's, uh, and I mentioned that, you know, as, again, this is sort of like if you're looking to the east, uh, looking uh, at the top here would be the south, uh, and this would be west and then north down here, if you're in the northern hemisphere. Again, uh, growing yang, declining yang, de declining to yin, where the yin is growing and then the yin is diminishing. So you have this cycle over the course of the day uh, that there's going to be some degree of lightness and darkness. And that actually changes each and every day. It's never the same day to day. Uh, it's, it's always in flux from one equilibrium to the next. Uh, and the, the overall uh, equilibrium is moving from the winter to the summer or from the summer to the winter depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, but if we look here at the, um, the vernal equinox, oh, we'll start here at the winter solstice. This is, the, the, uh, this is where the sun would be the, uh, well, this is sort of metaphoric here because the, uh, um, you know, this is kind of like the, uh, a little bit different of a layout, but sort of metaphorically, this is the least amount of sun uh, in the winter solstice, the most amount of sun over the course of a day on the summer solstice. And then there's equal amounts on the equinoxes, both the vernal equinox and the ultiminal uh, uh, equinox. So you'll notice that this same sort of pattern uh, in a category theoretic way is both uh, fractally representing both the course of a day, also the over the course of the entire year of these fluxes that are happening. So that's one dimension of processes is that they're fractally nested in this, uh, what's, what's called uh, in philosophy, mariological structure, meaning it's both a whole and a part of each other. Okay, so this is another visualization. This distance from here to here represents the amount of light, and this is the most lightness uh, over the course of the day, and from here to here represents the most darkness, and that's the winter solstice. And then uh, equinoxes, you see that it's actually equal between those. And then as you go from the summer to the autumn and to winter, you're increasing in darkness, and then from winter solstice to the summer solstice, you're increasing in lightness. So that just is a, again, it sort of forms this sort of yin yang symbol, but it's a, like a metaphor that talks about this flux from one extreme to the next. So uh, 
with each of these uh, polarities, uh, you can kind of project in any number of different dialectics, whether it's from uh, linear to cyclical. And again, this is sort of roughly corresponding to yang and yin, although not necessarily. It's just sort of uh, saying that any dialectic will have these different dimensions of uh, either it's going to be completely linear or completely uh, cyclical. Um, so this uh, one example could be, you know, if you're looking at say just uh, films uh, or you're looking at uh, something that has different cycles of unfolding of a video game. Uh, so in Chinese philosophy, they actually have the I Ching uh, and they have the trigrams and the trigrams actually have these combinations of yang and yin. Uh, and they actually have two arrangements of this and one arrangement in the, the early having Bagua that actually has the polarity relationships uh, uh, represented. So you can kind of think of this in, you know, uh, the Chinese didn't necessarily believe in a platonic realm of ideal forms, but if you, I, I you know, sort of subscribe that there could be some uh, platonic realm of eternal objects is what Whitehead calls it. Um, but in this eternal realm, you have these polarity uh, dimensions, but in the, the concrete embodied reality, then the order of these uh, trigrams are actually in the order in which that the seasons unfold. So in one dimension, you have the polarity relationships and in another dimension, you have the unfolding of the seasons that uh, there's just two different arrangements of, the, uh, of these trigrams. Um, so then you have the, uh, I guess, metaphorically, the static binary. Uh, you can think of just the ways that we create sort of arbitrary uh, binaries uh, of, let's say, you know, masculine or feminine. Um, it would be, you know, one where um, if you assign that to, uh, you know, some, if you assign that to sex, then you have like sort of a binary, but then you have people that, do, that are intersex that don't necessarily fit into that uh, static binary. But we have, I guess, uh, uh, metaphorically in a way of thinking, we tend to fall into this kind of black or white thinking. Uh, and in some ways I sort of uh, making a, a metaphor connection here to substance metaphysics in the sense that uh, it doesn't have any probabilistic dimension to it. Um, something like a quantum mechanics would have some, uh, you know, a quantum wave function dimension of it. But, you know, um, the, the structure of reality uh, when it comes to sort of a general relativistic point of view is sort of a, a, a fixed static block universe that actually has spatialized time such that time has already all happened. And it's, it's kind of like a deterministic world that we're living in. Um, and in, in that world, we don't necessarily have any free will or choice to be able to change how all that unfolds. It's like, we are just creatures that are unfolding of habit and there's everything that we're doing is kind of like just probabilistically what would happen again and again and again if you were to rerun the world as a simulation. I personally don't find that to be a uh, inspiring uh, vision of the universe. However, metaphysically, it's completely possible and I can't prove or disprove it. So it's certainly one possibility. But I, I tend to like the, uh, the idea that we are living in this world that's in dynamic spectrum, that's in flux, it's changing from uh, you know one extreme to the next in uh, what, uh, what uh, I guess Alfred North Whitehead uh, from his philosophy is the process relational metaphysics. And so one way to think about that is that when you look at say quantum mechanics and you're looking for the there that's there for the substance metaphysics, there's no there there. It's just, you know, kind of uh, these uh, infinite dimension Hilbert space from out of that, uh, it's theorized that all of uh, our space time is emergent out of this quantum flux kind of uh, realm. Uh, and Whitehead at the time was really, uh, Kind of exploring the some of the philosophical implications, but he was independently kind of working on trying to understand the nature of space time, and he really disagreed with Einstein. With Einstein trying to spatialize time into this fourth dimension, and he didn't necessarily, you know, think that was a he, he wasn't a fan of that. And so he was working on his own way of uh, of seeing how, rather than these substances, he he's he has a philosophy of organism that tries to put. Um, these structures that are kind of fractally nested on top of each other into these, um, you know, like if you look at some of these, you could look at some of these um, quantum uh, states as these kind of organisms. If you look at humans, they're organisms. If you look at galaxies, they're organisms. So his math structure you can think of as like this organism, which is all about how things are related to each other. So this is a what I would say is probably the, one of the biggest paradigm shifts uh, that not only VR or just like philosophically that I could be saying is, uh, I did an interview here recently with uh, Matt Siegel 
is really articulating the implications of this process relational way of thinking. Um, and there's some uh, physics books that I'm reading uh, by Timothy Eastman and some other folks that are really uh, what's called relational realism, saying that like the ultimate reality are just these relationships. Uh, category theory is another uh, thing that's really hot within um, mathematics. And that within itself is another way of trying to put all of mathematics on a foundation that is much more based upon these relationships of these things and, uh, and how they're related to each other. So category theory is, uh, you know, it's sort of a, at this point, still kind of mysterious as to what it is and how it works, but I suspect that there's going to be some uh, relational ontology that's behind it. So anyway, back to uh, these different dialectics, because I think it's kind of interesting to, to compare and contrast, you know, say Kronos time from Kairos time, Kronos time is like the the quant the 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 objectified measurement of the time. You know what time is it, and uh, it's it's much more like you're measuring like you work for eight hours a day, uh, or we met here at uh, you know I'm in uh, it's noon for me, but maybe three o'clock for you on the East Coast. And the Kairos time is much more about the quality of the moment. It's more about the emotions, and it, it's much more about your associative links. How uh, much are you engaged in terms of your cognitive load? Um, or do you get uh, a lot of sensory experience? Because uh, your sensory experience actually impacts your perception of time, uh, they're finding from a neuroscience perspective. And so the Kairos time is much more about the quality of the moment of the time, whereas the, the Kronos time is much more about the quantity of the time. You also have this monochronic uh, way of looking at it. So this is like one fixed linear uh, uh, cycle that's unfolding. And the polychronic would be like, many different cycles that are unfolding at different scales all at the same time. So you can think of like a mother who is uh, holding a baby, who's also cooking a meal, who's also to, you know on the phone on a conversation. All of these are kind of unfolding cycles that are processes that each have their own time scale. Uh, and the polychronic way of thinking is like, um, you know, you show up when, <laughs> when it's time. You'll, it's like uh, kind of Africa time is a, a polychronic culture. Uh, where it's less about the precision of uh, the linearity of the time, but more of really paying, paying attention to that quality of that moment, um, but really also paying attention to the unfolding cycles that are happening. Um, and with process philosophy, it's all about uh, you're, modulized, you're, you're modulating someone's consciousness by a series of different uh, hierarchically, hierarchically nested processes that are unfolding. That's just one way to kind of think about what you're doing with experiential design. So again, the linearity versus the nonlinearity. Um, and I think this is where it gets to a lot of where we've seen a lot of the paradigm shift that's already happened from this more iterative way of thinking that has come from software design. Because if you think about like architecture and films, they still kind of follow this linear uh, process that has a pre-production, production, and post-production phase in film. And you have the design phases and then you're building and then you know, you're basically kind of done you have a fixed static object that isn't necessarily being updated. But if you think of something like a video game, it's like, you know, constantly iterating. It's like nonstop of this iterative uh, process. And I think this is where a lot of the agile and lean processes start to come in when it comes to uh, how to develop software, because you're talking about the human experience and trying to modulate the human experience. And the humans, humans can't be modeled mathematically. So there's no way to, to, to say from a computer simulation what something is going to feel like. That's philosophically what they call qualia, where you can imagine what it might be like, but you never really know until you actually experience it because you're at that point able to kind of match your expectations with the actual embodied experience of it. And you don't know what it's going to actually feel like until you actually do it, which I think is why you have to keep doing this more iterative sort of process. So I think naturally this kind of process relational ways kind of leading into what I see as a lot of the foundations of modern software development is this kind of iterative processes. So again, just coming back to uh, this uh, graphic where we talked about the dialectic between the hot and the cold and the wet and the dry. This is a, a case where you actually have two, um, two dialectics that are uh, at the same time and how that kind of formulates for what I see is kind of the natural affordances of the active presence, the mental and social presence, the emotional presence, and then embodied and environmental presence. Um, and later I'll be diving into the context uh, and you can kind of think about the context as like the domains of human experience where we have a lot of the different aspects of our lives that are private and we have other aspects of our lives that are public. 
uh, but you also have things that are more related to yourself as an individual, but also other, uh, you know, the contexts that are involved with other people. So you have self, other, private, and public as uh, just two dialectics that you could start to arrange uh, some of these different contexts that I'll be diving into in more detail here uh, in a future section. Um, and this is a, a good moment to kind of talk about the uh, the Hegelian dialectic, which is the uh, whenever you have two um, polarities, you have this process where they you can think about these these polar opposites where they don't have anything in common, and so you have to kind of sit in the tension of those opposites, uh, and until you can in include the the positive things in both perspectives, and also the and uh, transcend the negative things. So you're kind of transcending and including uh, and combining things together into a new synthesis. So you have an idea, you have the antithesis, which is some sort of dialectical relationship that is, uh, you know, kind of like again, like the yang and the yin is a good metaphor. But it's not like a, a, a binary relationships. It's more on a spectrum where they're the you know uh, one example I guess uh, and is like freedom and security. You know, like if you want complete security, then you may take away your freedoms. But if you want complete freedoms, then you're going to be in a fundamentally kind of insecure aspect. And so, how do you manage these dialectics where you're trying to find a middle ground between okay, where do you need to compromise different aspects of uh, giving up some of your freedoms uh, versus having more security. I mean, you could sort of unpack how masks uh, fit into this kind of dialectic relationship where the United States is trying to reach the synthesis where they're trying to balance, you know, maintaining people's personal liberties, but at the same time, taking care of the collective safety and security of the entire population. So we're trying, this uh, thesis antithesis process um, happens where you have these two dialectics uh, and then they have this, tr uh, they kind of get combined in some way where there's a, a, a deliberative process where, um, you know, like a, a good example is uh, uh, when you have a judge and a jury, you know, you're trying to, justice is trying to acquit the innocent, but also prosecute the guilty. Uh, but you can't do that with one person. You actually need two people that are uh, maintaining those polarity extremes of those dialectics. And then you present their case in collaboration. Uh, they're collaborating together towards justice, presenting their case to the jury and the judge to be able to come up to a final decision. But that's an example of like how from one perspective, you can't come up with the answer, but you kind of have to uh, participate in this deliberative dialectical process that kind of creates a new synthesis. And then from there, the synthesis becomes the new thesis, and then you have the process that happens all over again. So for me, I think that the, the Hegelian dialectic uh, is a fundamental part of how moment to moment there is a, uh, a combination of this moment of what you're feeling combined with the next aspect of what that's feeling that creates the synthesis that then becomes the new thesis for the next moment that comes along. Again, that's sort of a, uh, uh, metaphorically because the, the true nature of time is very mysterious. So we don't actually quite really know what's happen actually happening moment to moment, but that's at least one metaphor that I think of is like this fractally nested, uh, every moment is containing all the previous moments uh, up until the future that is, the future is kind of like this boundless potential that uh, hasn't been decided yet, but has all these other characteristics that are happening. So anyway, the Hegelian dialectic for me is a really handy metaphor to help kind of make sense of how these processes are unfolding. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pause again to see if there's any questions about uh, the more, the dialectics and the polarities, which for me, I think is kind of a, a fundamental aspect that kind of both point, points to a lot of these aspects of process, but hopefully will be intuitive enough to kind of get the sense of what I mean by them uh, and how, uh, what I see in the process of design, any design framework is trying to map out what those dialectical relationships are and evaluating what happens across what uh, what I would say are these different equivalence classes of trying to make these different trade-offs between these different aspects. Uh, and that's what designers do is that they, you can't do perfect of everything. You have to, uh, you can't have, uh, uh, you, you have trade-offs that you have to make. Uh, and then learning how to navigate those trade-offs and to understand from your own personal experience and then calibrate it to the collective experience, I think is the whole part of what I think, uh, you know, experiential design is so exciting is because it's, you know, we're, we're having to find new, new ways of making sense and new language and uh, new conceptual frameworks to be able to make sense of all of this different design. So with that, I'll sort of pause here for a few moments to see if there's any uh, questions. All right, uh, I'll move on to the next phase there, using design disciplines. As we're talking about the, the different design disciplines, 
whether or not the design is like for a film, it's like a linear film. And for an interactive um, video game, it's much more of like this uh, agency. And so as I was talking before, there's kind of different design processes that are used. And the challenge is how do you combine these two? Where the on one end of like architecture and filmmaking, um, you know, maybe even like theater, you have much more of this waterfall approach. And then the agile approach is kind of like this different paradigm. And so like architects, they don't have to worry about like an iterative design. In fact, it may actually be not safe at all to kind of do an iterative process and building a building because it's just not going to be secure. So there's, but when you're building it virtually, then it's sort of opening up all these new design paradigms that, you know, architects now all of a sudden may start to be able to adopt these more agile processes, whereas before they weren't able to. So what's that start to look like when you start to fuse these existing disciplines with all these other disciplines together? So for a film, it had much like a, you know, very fixed, you know, pre-production, production, post-production, post where, you know, they've kind of got it down to a science of having a pitch. You uh, kind of do storyboards and, you know, there's a whole industry of people that are, you know, it's their job to help estimate. And obviously estimates are never perfect. They're, you know, the budgets, uh, they do their best, but uh, as, as far as it goes, they do a really good job of trying to um, spe uh, specify uh, this kind of distinct phases as you're producing something, which is totally not what like a video game. <laughs> There's certain aspects of this for video games, but it's, it looks a lot different. Um, so Alex McDowell, uh, he has a world building institute. And one of the things that he did was he started to kind of map out that linear process. This is still a linear process in terms of, you know, this is kind of going around from the, you can see the storyboards here kind of, you know, from the script uh, and then starting out uh, in the shooting and then the production and then the post-production here in the editing. Uh, but you can kind of see all these different roles of previews and the uh, the uh, VFX and the props and the set design, the uh, research, you know, uh, and then the post-production, all those different visual effects. And, you know, this is like a whole industry of all these different uh, jobs and job descriptions. As you watch any movie, you see all these different categories. And this is like one visualization to see how that kind of flows uh, over the course of the time. Um, and there's going to be probably similarities here for XR experiences, but also a lot of differences as well. It's going to look probably a lot more of whatever the equivalent of what this graphic would look like uh, for game design. So for architecture, again, you go through this very linear process where you're starting and you're uh, doing the pre-design, schematic design, and you're, you're eventually getting to the uh, construction uh, and actually building it. And then you're done. Uh, you have the object and you kind of move on to the next project. Uh, so again, uh, another just way of looking at construction as it goes through this linear process. Uh, and again, here's another one, you know, more or less when you, whatever different construction of these physical buildings, you're going to kind of see the same linear process here. But when you look at game design, it's like this uh, iterative, uh, uh, a continuously iterative process of uh, first uh, prototyping and implementing and play testing and then brainstorming. And then you're going around and around again again, where each of the, the results from the playtesting feeds back into new ideas. Uh, and you kind of cultivate your own intuition in terms of what feels good. You're having an embodied experience based upon modulating your consciousness through these immersive experiences. Uh, and over time, you just cultivate an embodied intuition. The more game developers I talk to, like Robin Haneke, she's like, when I ask her, how does this work? She's like, well, you just do it enough. And you just, just like any other uh, expertise that you can gather, you just kind of gain a little bit of a sixth sense and an embodied intuition that may not even be articulated into words all the time. You just kind of get a gut sense. And then um, the, the goal is to be able to uh, experience something that you know for yourself is good and be able to extrapolate it out to have other people experience the same thing and then also think it's good. <laughs> it sounds like a simple thing, but it's like, you know, terribly difficult to be able to do that one thing. Okay. And then then there was the, the lean software, kind of like we have the build, measure, learn. Uh, so all the software development practices, again, we're kind of moving into this more iterative uh, processes. And the scrum methodology um, takes a little bit different approach where you have these, uh, these different sprints and then you have the daily scrum where you're kind of keeping updated, but you have this kind of rhythm where over the, these two week sprints or whatever the sprint length is that you're able to, from the first part say, hey, we think we wanna be able to achieve this. And then you actually go and build it and deal with all the different bugs. And you know, at the end of it, you try to uh, come up with something that's working. And then you, at that point, are testing it. You just keep doing that until you finish it. Uh, and again, the Kanban board was another approach that actually came from more of the Japanese 
uh, production line where it was much more of a pull model. So they would be looking at what was needed uh, from the production line, and then that information was radiated backwards. And so they have the Kanban board, which is one way of having limits for how things move forward. And then if there's blockers, then there's ways to send that information down so that it can get unblocked and have just a, a, a flow of uh, production. So this, this Kanban is uh, for something that's a little bit more, uh, less like knowledge work, uh, a little bit more of like uh, production, but it still works for software design. Um, but uh, the Scrum works really, really well for if you're kind of doing really exploratory work where the Kanban uh, probably works a little bit better if you have a little bit better sense of uh, scoping things and just, you know, keeping things moving. Uh, so you can combine these things, you know, into these different ways of from concrete to abstract where you're going back and forth and moving from the early phases into the lean, into the agile, you know, there's just different ways of kind of, you know, seeing how you can have different loops within loops. Um, lots of, uh, but again, I think for me, it just keeps coming back to like this, these unfolding processes. If there's one thing that I see that's gonna be uh, universal across all these design disciplines is that it's probably gonna look something more like this than something that it was before with the linear process. So whatever these different phases end up being, it's gonna be uh, building something, checking in, uh, and then you know also trying to set an intention for who you're trying to connect with and why you're doing it, uh, which I think it, I'll be diving into a little bit more here, uh, which is like the, looking at a lot of the different aspects of like the elements of user experience uh, by uh, Jesse James Garrett. Uh, again, you have the strategy and the scope, the structure, the skeleton, the surface, uh, moving from the abstract to the concrete, uh, there's existing processes that web developers have been developing for decades now at this point, where they've really got it down pretty good for what the design process is. And I think as we move forward, we're probably going to be using a lot of those similar things that web design has been able to be developing and start to apply that to experiential design as well. But the sensory design, rather than just being a website, is going to be like a fully sensory experience. Uh, but there's also going to be narrative design and other aspects that may not be included in here. Uh, because this is more about information. Uh, this is, I'd say is more of a, a mental and social, uh, but the narrative design has a, like a different structure that I'll be getting into here in a little bit. Uh, so there's a, a guy named John Boyd who's really interesting because he, in 1976 on September 3rd, uh, wrote this paper called Destruction and Creation. Actually, it's just a couple of days after I was born. So, you know, it's right around my, my vintage <laughs> of the 1976 uh, uh, September. So he... He was uh, coming up with, uh, he was like a military analyst and he was reading all these different things about girdle and incompleteness. And he was trying to like figure out um, how do you do the best that you can of being able to make uh, decisions within an environment that's constantly changing. And this is like the challenge of any sort of, well, anybody in reality actually, because reality is always changing. But in this case, uh, if you're in the military context, you're making observations, you're trying to take all this information and orient yourself with all this uh, sensor data that's coming in, that's uh, the sense-making process that's trying to give you a map and model of what's happening. And from that, you're making a decision, but uh, those decisions are also based upon the rules of engagement, but those decisions are feeding back because this whatever you're deciding is actually changing the what you're observing, uh, especially as you, um, well, you're, what you're deciding isn't necessarily always changing, but how you're taking action certainly is. Um, but uh, if you do make a decision, then that can feed back into kind of like when you're turning on a water faucet uh, and you're trying to see whether or not you should uh, turn it uh, up more to get more heat or not, you kind of have this feedback loop uh, cycle there. So anyway, this OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, act, if I were trying to boil down to the essence of what some of these uh, iterative processes are, it, I think it has a structure that's very much like this, which is a, a feedback loop st uh, structure. Um, so again, coming back to this uh, story, uh, the spectrum of story authorship from uh, author to generative narrative, um, you start to see like, how would you blend together these existing narrative design of a cinematic filmmaking that has a different production process than like a, 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 a filmmaking. I mean, game developers have been struggling with this for decades now, uh, trying to blend these two worlds and to a different degree, there's lots of different ways to do that. But, um, you know, some of the things that I found uh, useful, at least as I was looking at different design approaches, this just general design thinking process where uh, the empathize, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, test. Again, this kind of gets back to a lot of these things that we're showing before, but the, um, you know, Stanford had a number of different um, uh, uh, PDFs and whatnot. This one, 
was interesting because it, it's really connecting this ethnography to the experiments, the idea creation, this point where the ethnography is really talking to the users, trying to really understand their context, what are their problems. Um, and there's different ways that uh, the output there is this empathy map where what are the use the, the people that you're targeting for any of these different experiences? Like, what are they hearing? What are they doing? What are they saying? What are they seeing? You can see that's correlated to each of these uh, sensors. But then what are they thinking? What are they feeling? Um, and then uh, who are we empathizing with in terms of who this person is? And then what do they need to do? So if you look at all these, I think it, it actually kind of maps over to a lot of the same different types of qualities of presence, which is the active presence, mental and social presence, emotional presence, and embodied and environmental presence. You know, these what they're what they're sensing in the environment, what they're feeling, their emotions, what they're doing, what their actions are, and what choices do they need to make. You know, at the essence, it's a very similar. Uh, and this is just another way of kind of mapping that out. Um, and you know, again, this is uh, when I did an interview with uh, Robin Hunnicky, One of the things that she, with her uh, game design framework, she starts with the emotion, and I think that's very similar to what the uh, the uh, design thinking empathy gu field guide is also saying is that at the end of the day, you're trying to take someone's existing emotional affect and you're trying to modulate it in some impact. I mean, there's, there's going to be an emotional dimension. There's going to be other context and quality and character, other things that I'll be getting into. Not everything is just about emotion and these empathies, but it's a pretty good baseline. If you were to like just start with one thing, it would be like, what type of experience do you want to give to the person who's going through this? Is it vigilance, rage, loathing, grief, amazement, terror, admiration? You know, any wide range of different potential emotions that you could have um, here. Um, and there's also uh, this uh, spectrum here from high control, low control, negative valence to positive valence, which roughly also uh, kind of translates over into the uh, the four elements as well in terms of the uh, the anger and the the laughter and the joy and the depression and the sadness and the um, you know, kind of uh, feelings of wonder and awe and love. So, you know, when you think about um, this map here of what are they trying to achieve, these thinkings and feelings. Uh, so, there's a thing called nonviolent communication that has a whole theory that um, you have basic needs in life, and these are the needs that everybody has. Uh, and if one of your needs aren't being met, then that will create a symptom of a feeling. But the feelings are often kind of symptomatic to a much deeper need that you may have in order just to, to survive and to uh, attain this kind of flourishing. So this is just another way of looking at the feelings and needs. Uh, and I'll be diving into this in terms of the character. For me, um, there's lots of different dimensions of the character that also could be feeding into the different types of experiences that you're trying to, to create, not just feelings and needs, but also you know aspects of will and courage and uh, faith or intelligence, you know, these other aspects that could also be these inputs that you're trying to use uh, as an input or uh, whatever you're trying to design for your experience. <clears throat> the other uh, point that I just wanted to bring in here is uh, Aristotle's four causes. Um, so he said there's the a formal cause, which is kind of like the blueprint of reality. Um, and there's a little bit of debate uh, philosophically in terms of, like the formal causation, like is are these math structures? What is the math structure's relationship to reality? Is it um, does it actually have like a platonic form? Is it, is it a platonic realm of ideal form that's somehow actually causally interacting with reality in some dimension, uh, or are math objects just uh, nom uh, naming things like uh, nom nominalism, which is just uh, it's referencing an, a sign, but it's not actually any sort of causal impact or, or any sort of direct impact at all. Uh, but this. It's a kind of a fun idea to think about the blueprint of uh, the math structure that you're creating, creating some sort of like whatever you're designing at the design phase could have actual uh, real causal impact of what you end up creating. Uh, these are the wireframes. These are the, the storyboards. Um, these are all the sort of strategy documents and all that else that actually sort of specking that out and starting to visualize it. Um, it it's a, a useful thing, whether or not it actually has any direct causal impact or not. I think it's a at the end of the day, it has utility because it's useful. Uh, so that's a blueprint that has a math structure design and shape. And of the material cause, this is all the, the material in which you're actually making of this. And in this case, you already have a VR headset. So the material cause in some sense is all the ones and the zeros and the Unity game engine and the GPUs and everything else that's sort of actually allowing you to actually experience these immersive experiences. And you have the efficient cause, which is the actual people that are 
the agents and the ma and the knowledge that is going into actually creating um, uh, these experiences. Uh, and th the one that I think is actually probably the most interesting is the final cause. This is like your purpose. Um, and I would argue that, um, you know, te teleology is something philosophically that has uh, come and gone in terms of um, currently it's not really in favor, but I, I think folks like Whitehead are trying to bring back these uh, ideas of teleology, uh, just in the sense that um, your intention can have impact for what actually unfolds, um, because it, it's sort of embedded into this unfolding process in some sort of, you know, kind of mysterious ways in which that, that could be integrating with the fabric of reality itself as these unfolding processes through kind of the mechanism of like Jungian synchronicity, or just for the pure fact of like, whatever intention that you're, you're doing for experience, I find is probably when I talk to artists, that is usually the highest predictive factor of how the experience ends up. It's like they were trying to make me feel a certain way, then that is embedding in every sing single dimension of their experience, this kind of final cause for why this thing exists in the first place. So this purpose, theological impulse and final causation, I would say is a pretty key part for making sense of any of these different design frameworks. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're making something for some purpose. Um, and however you measure that or however you make that happen, there's a lot of mysterious magic for how the human brain and consciousness works and how we come together to make stuff. But I think that's uh, kind of, an, uh, I would flag as something to kind of pay attention to in terms of uh, just an underlying philosophical foundation for any of these design frameworks. Uh, and again, uh, these original design thinking was in a linear path, but you can put it into this path of empathizing with the user, you're defining what you want, you're ideating and prototyping, testing and implementing. And then at the end of the day, you have to kind of check in with the person to, to get some feedback through that testing. And then based upon that feedback, then you do the whole cycle again and again and again. Uh, so I guess in summary, you I've sort of talked about the existing waterfall processes. Uh, and I, I see that there's still a lot of really good ways, especially for narrative design and film, where this just really works. Um, and there's like a tried and true method. And uh, there's ways in which that those techniques will still have to find some way to take this structure and map it over to this structure over here, which is much more agile and iterative. So again, uh, just to kind of recap the, the different um, uh, aspects of the uh, uh, mental social presence, active presence, emotional presence, and embodied presence. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll pause here and see if there's any uh, questions from anybody. Um, I just wanted to stop for a second, Ken, and just say, I think, uh, I think what you're digging into here is so interesting. And I'm kind of thinking about it as an exercise in like experiential cartography. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like what you're doing is, is laying out the level of uh, of complexity that goes into just trying to understand what the human experience is, what the human, ex human experience is made up of. And then when you can get to that, like, because in order to understand human experience, you have to understand time, you have to understand emotion, you have to understand all of these dichotomies that you dug into about what makes up the, the, the totality of, of how we interact with things. And then once you can get there, then you can actually start thinking about designing experiences, right? And when you, um, and you, you can certainly design experiences without all of that thinking and all of that knowledge, but when you can start to kind of hone in on some of that and get to some of these deeper layers, then, then you gain the ability to play with those pieces um, in a way that is not accessible to you um, if you don't have that thinking. So, um, but yeah, it's a, there's a there's a there's a a level of complexity and also a level of curiosity curiosity that I think is needed to kind of do that exploring. So, um, yeah, yeah, that's, just, that's more of just my kind of general comment <laughs> on like what we've been engaging with and uh, giving everybody else a little bit of a reference point. So. Yeah, just to follow on that point, um, I think in a lot of ways, what experiential designers are doing is that you really have to come up with a, a working model of consciousness. Uh, short, short and simple, you're, you're, we're trying to map a model of consciousness, which at this point is one of the biggest open questions in philosophy and science. I mean, it's not been answered what even consciousness is. 
Um, and so we're, we're kind of like uh, poking at it and, and being able to kind of modulate it in little ways and, and kind of maybe use different perceptual illusions or kind of hijack our, our, our senses in different ways. But uh, in a lot of ways, at the end of the day, a good experiential design framework is going to be a really robust model of consciousness. Um, and the thing about consciousness is that I'm in an unfolding process. So like, I may have an experience of something right now, but if I do that same experience a week from now, I'm going to have a different experience of that. So you're not only uh, dealing with something that you yourself are an unfolding process, but the whole world is unfolding where we have kind of these big context switches that sometimes are happening. It would seemingly be uh, instantaneously, but it's like not instantaneously. It's happening over decades and decades and decades. It just sort of hits this tipping point where these new awarenesses, whether it's from feminism or with, you know, Me Too and all these other aspects of harassment and just even the, the sexism that happened with the Britney uh, Spears and Paris Hilton and all these documentaries that are allowing us to reflect and be like, oh my gosh, to have this whole new perspective, everything from like racism and all the ways of sy systemic racism that is kind of embedded into our society uh, at the core uh, and then how that plays out. Uh, there's all these ways in which that um, we have to be aware of the deepest levels of context uh, but also deal with trying to create experiences for a moving target uh, where, you know, you never know, like maybe this is the perfect experience for someone, but they see it at the right time. So this, this gets into, I think the quality of the moment of like, not only like when is the right time to have an experience, but also being able to kind of like track your own unfolding and kind of like sync up you having the right experience at the right time. Uh, we're in. We're moving into what Pine and Gilmore called the experiential age, uh, or like the experiential, you know, economy is what they called it. But I, I sort of call it the experiential age. But right after the experiential age is going to be the transformational age. That's going to be having transformational experiences that are deeply meaningful, uh, on demand. Uh, so that that is yet another level of what do we need to be able to do that. Um, but yeah, I think the, the point that you raised there is really good and just in the sense of, um, you know, th this is a really like over ambitious uh, project <laughs> that I've been doing here in the Voices of VR. Uh, but everybody in their own way has like their hand on the elephant of trying to figure out. Um, and the challenge is to try to pluralistically take all those different insights from all those different perspectives and be able to kind of come up with a meta framework that allows you to kind of like uh, code switch uh, for all these different perspectives uh, to allow this kind of massive interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, so I think by focusing on the phenomenological qualities and context and character and story of an experience that, that for me at least, that's like a baseline for which you could at least have all these other disciplines do their own translation for how architects are related to space and how game designers are related to the agency and how the web design is about user interaction and, and presentation of information and knowledge management and you know, and then the, the filmmakers are all about like really modulating your emotions. And then what do you get when you mash all those things together? Yeah, absolutely. And we, it's, it's interesting as we, you know, in, in this, in this group of people, uh, in this class, we have a handful of interior designers who in their process work, uh, you know, ideating and designing a space. So much of that work is mapping out the experience of a space through, blocking and bubble diagrams and creating core relationships between core experiences and doing a like basically like doing the work that we've been talking about for the last hour of like defining and correlating relationships between different types of experiences and different types of spaces and doing dialectic exercises in in adjustment. Um, and so I'm just, I'm mostly saying that because if they're not making that connection, I'm making that connection <laughs> um, for them. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna leave a second if, if anybody else wants to jump in with a question. All right, uh, I'll move on to the next phase there, um, which is context and world building. Uh, so going back to the four dimensions of experience, you have the quality, context, character, and story. We talked about all the different dimensions of presence that we, you know, and there's, again, you can split that qualities up into lots of different, <clears throat> excuse me, qualities, whether it's like the, the five elements within Chinese philosophy or other, other approaches as well. Uh, but the context uh, are, all, are all about like the domains of human experience that 
uh, we're talking about. Right now, you're listening to me give a lecture in the context of higher education. And uh, this is a part of my own work. So I'm at my work, but also just sort of uh, lecturing and giving a, a, a lecture. So that's our context right now. It's a sort of educational, higher educational context. Okay, so if you watch the, uh, the ethics talk that I gave, uh, I, div I dive deep into trying to map out all these different ethical and moral dilemmas through the lens of context. I first came across it by asking uh, the, uh, all of my interviewees at the end of each interview, what do you think the ultimate potential of VR is? Uh, and their answers would usually fall into one of the different domains of human experience, whether it's entertainment, medicine, uh, hanging out with your romantic partners, um, or uh, dealing with death and grieving, uh, higher education, travel, spirituality, philosophy, uh, your career, uh, hanging out with friends and families, isolation, uh, you know, different aspects of diversity and inclusion and accessibility, uh, expressing your identity and your embodiment in new ways, uh, and then uh, being able to exchange virtual goods and have virtual resources, having uh, early education, communication, and telepresence, um, having your own virtual homes and uh, uh, virtual property, but also being able to connect to your, your, your family. Um, and uh, yeah, and ultimately also be connected to the earth itself. So all these different contexts um, were kind of a baseline as I were talking to people, each of these kind of form these different industry verticals. Um, and uh, they also happen to kind of form some of the aspects of the, uh, the world building as I uh, go back here. <clears throat> um, so my, uh, Alex McDowell has this uh, world building mandala that you can uh, find online. He's got a, a blog post. Um, I just find it really rich. There was a lot of really cool uh, uh, experiences this past year at Sundance in terms of starting to implement different dimensions of Alex's uh, framework. Um, and I'm going to be unpacking it from my own uh, take on this. There's some overlaps that I have, but I wanted to point out a few things here. First of all, you can see like in the middle is the human. And as you go out, it's getting into larger and larger scales. You can see here, here it says individual scale, family, community, city to world. So as you go outward, you're getting into more and more things of like the environment, the economy. Uh, but you also have these different, you know, areas of like culture and energy and biology, you know, uh, music, community, healthcare. So these are all, all of these different things are the contexts. So when you think about world building, you uh, like if you're building a sci-fi world, you would want to imagine, okay, what does it look like to, if someone gets sick to get medical care? Like if you think about like Star Wars as an example or Star Trek, you know, they all have their own advanced kind of like sci-fi-esque takes on what the future of healthcare is. And so in some ways, the world building is kind of like this speculative sci-fi design where you pick each of these different contexts and you have to, in some sense, make a prediction about where culture is right now and then uh, create a model that says, this is how it's gonna change in the future given these different inputs. Um, and so, you know, Alex, his approach, he takes a lot of uh, different uh, people from different backgrounds, expertises, and kind of brings all these different experts together and has them just talk about stuff. So now that there's all these things like Clubhouse and everything else, uh, you can start to do these types of distributed world building exercises or uh, create a vision of the future that you want to live into and actually build an immersive experience that creates an art, uh, a cultural artifact that helps make it real to people. Just like when people read something like Ready Player One, it gave them a vision of what the future of VR could be. And that was in 2011. And all these people who were you know, already tinkering in it got super inspired. And then uh, it was a... Uh, a synchronistic concrescence of things that were happening and arising at the same moment. And sometimes these uh, speculative sci-fi uh, stories can really inspire the actual manifestation. If you look at the history of VR, that's happened time and time again, whether it's through Snow Crash and uh, you know, Neuromancer, lots of different science fiction novels that were ahead of saying what's gonna come. And that's all about that world building, which I think is really exciting because you can start to do a lot of that within VR. And so this is, this, this chapter here is kind of my take on it uh, based on you know some input from Alex, but sort of uh, independently developed, I guess, uh, for me since uh, 2015. Okay, so uh, you can see here the scope of like uh, going into to the self and to the, the, the larger body, uh, to the higher and higher levels of, of context and identity. So you can think about the, the self, the family, community, other, world, and cosmos as just 
ways in which that you have, you starting with yourself, but then have, uh, um, in terms of moral development, you could think about these as ways in which that the more that you're taking in consideration other people, the more sort of a higher stages of moral development that are. If you're only thinking about yourself, then that's not like a very morally evolved or ethically evolved way of interacting with the world. You have to kind of like be in relationship to the other people in the world. And that as soon as you have like all of your basic needs met, then ideally you start to be more and more better relationship to all these other scopes of identity and context. But um, the other thing to point out is that this is kind of a nested hierarchy where you're both a, 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 whole, a whole within your own self, but also a part of a larger context. And so this is a kind of a nested model of context um, where uh, from a, you know, a, I guess a math structure perspective of processes, processes are these kind of hierarchical structures and processes that are kind of embedded within each other. All right, so uh, Arthur Kostler had a word, he called them holon, which is simultaneously whole or part. Um, the philosophical term is Mariology, um, which uh, sort of translates to the whole part. But you could see that you could go from the atoms to molecules or in gels, and then each, each, each successful level is more and more levels of complexity. And this is what uh, each one of these stages is what uh, Whitehead would kind of characterize as these organisms uh, that are kind of scale independent um, structures that go all the way down to atoms, all the way up to like the, you know, you could see over here to the right, uh, up into like the planet, star system, galaxy, all and up to the universe and potentially even the multiverse, if that exists. Um, so again, you could see how there's kind of like, you know, uh, putting physics here at the bottom, uh, Whitehead would actually put biology at the bottom uh, because he puts uh, processes as more fundamental uh, than, than the physics. Um, so, okay. Uh, so another useful, uh, Thing that comes up a lot for me is Lessig's pathetic dot theory, which he says that there's these four things that you have to be able to modulate in order to kind of bring about change in society. You have the uh, cultural norms, you have the law, the market, uh, market dynamics, and the technological architecture and the code. Um, so obviously, the there's a kind of a structure to these in terms of like the the culture is going to impact both the market and the law and the technology, uh, but there's also feedback loops here where the, these also are impacting each other. Um, and so uh, another way that I think about this as uh, the communications medium as process, meaning that there's uh, new emerging technologies that provide new affordances, and then you have creators that come along uh, and they, they explore the extent of what those technologies can do. They make stories and art and other experiences. Um, and then distributors uh, find some ways to get those experiences into the hand of, of audiences to be able to experience this new work. And then finally, uh, the audiences learn how to watch this new work, and then they provide feedback uh, to both the technology itself, but also the creators. Um, and there's also an interim step in here eventually, which is the kind of the, um, you know, the filtering and the journalism and the uh, you know, the, the film festivals. In some sense, that's kind of like in the distribution area of just kind of helping to um, make aware uh, in the case of like film festivals as, as an example, but also there's like Steam and, um, you know, the itch.io and uh, uh, Oculus ha has their own um, stores. So actual physical the, the ways in which to get um, content in the hands of people. The As an example, 360 video uh, for the longest time hasn't really been necessarily well monetized. I mean, there's YouTube, but there's not like a, uh, a good distribution platform to be able to sell uh, immersive narratives uh, in a way that was really able to sustain that ecosystem. So the lack of distribution was really stifling to really having that 360 medium really develop. But for gaming, it's been great. And you've had a, a really robust ecosystem of, of VR gaming. But other areas like say, you know, productivity, uh, Facebook, for whatever reason, has decided to only focus on gaming, which, you know, in some sense ser serves their own needs. Uh, but there's all these other industry verticals that have been artificially stifled because they haven't been able to get distribution from some of the major distributors. Like it doesn't make sense to put it on Steam and Oculus for whatever reason hasn't been as open with accepting different things that could potentially be competitive with their own uh, ecosystem. So that's a whole other ethical issue, but that's just uh, worth calling out there that that's a dynamic of the uh, communications as a process. But if we were to kind of take this, uh, and try to map it over into something that, that looks a little bit more like this, then I would say like at the base is the culture and from the culture is uh, helping to form the laws that are uh, shaping the economy and the economy um, you know, are shaping the different types of experiences that we have. Uh, and there's different apps that are created 
uh, there's uh, the uh, operating system layer and then the hardware uh, and the technology. Now, whether or not this is actually like um, a, a true hierarchy or whether it's much more like what how uh, Lessig envisioned it, which is you know more of a uh, their equivalent in there. Um, but I'd say that the culture definitely impacts the law and the market and the technology. Um, and the, and, the, and the law definitely impacts what can and cannot exist on the market. So there is some directions there, but there's also feedback loops as well. So I think it's important just to, to note there. Uh, but in some ways, we have the most leverage as a culture to kind of decide how all of this plays out. So that's just another way of kind of conceiving of all of this. Um, so you can also have like these technology stacks, which has like the network layer, the operating system. You know, the, you we, we've all seen these different tech stacks, and they kind of roughly translate into like the uh, the hardware uh, uh, and architecture and the code as well as user experience. Uh, this mapping doesn't necessarily go on up into the laws and the, and the actual human experience. Uh, it just sort of says all the user experience. It doesn't go into the higher level institutions or anything like that because it's just you know mostly thinking about the tech stack. Um, and here's another way in which that, um, this was from a, a uh, I'm a part of the IEEE XR ethics and someone posted this, I'm actually not sure exactly where it's from, but uh, they put like security engineering and they have the, uh, the same type of uh, hierarchy, but then they, they say at the top is the laws and then the social norms and, you know, community led principles. I, I'd say, you know, you could sort of switch these around. It's sort of debatable as to what order they are, uh, just in terms of uh, you absolutely have to follow the laws. Um, when you're making some of these different immersive experiences, say like the COPPA laws, or there's different ways as you build experiences, you have to be compliant. If you have children less than 13 years old, as an example, you have to follow, follow COPPA. Uh, or uh, if it's for education, you have to follow FERPA. If you have medical uh, information, you have to file HIPAA. So there's certain ways in which that the laws are shaping the different experiences based upon what the context is. Um, so that's just worth calling out. Uh, and this was a, a another a visualization that I found on the Stanford site. They go data, technologies, products, experiences, systems, implications. You know, same type of idea where you start in the small and you go in the big, um, but you kind of has this kind of nested hierarchical structure here. All right, so uh, moving on to the more aspects of the context in the world building. Uh, so let's uh, talk about the context. This is kind of my take. Uh, I was really uh, covering kind of the, the world building aspect from uh, and the nested hierarchy from um, uh, from Alex. Uh, and then uh, after this section, I'll take a, a break for more questions. Okay, so coming back to this, we're gonna come back to this to the end uh, because again, there's lots of stuff in there. You could really just meditate on all these different mappings of how um, he's created different aspects of uh, these contexts. Um, so for me, these are the, uh, which I showed very briefly early, earlier. This is the initial take that I had of, uh, you know, uh, this uh, I think I presented this uh, in 2016 uh, or 2015 or 2016. I think it's actually 2000. One of the two. Um, but I gave this is my, actually my, one of my first talks that I gave uh, was summarizing the uh, first 500 episodes of the Voices of VR. A highly ambitious uh, talk, and then I ended up sort of uh, coming up to these different uh, equivalents classes of context. Um, and so just as a kind of a brief run through, uh, just to kind of be a flavor of some of these, you, you talk about like identity and having like a fashion show or uh, being able to buy merchandise uh, at a Roblox concert. And so being able to buy virtual goods and resources or uh, early education, um, you have uh, being able to, to connect to your friends and family through like uh, virtual Zoom calls. Um, you have virtual concerts within Fortnite, um, telemedicine um, with telerobots. Uh, so using virtual technologies for, for medical applications. Um, you have virtual dates uh, going on date with your, uh, your romantic partner. Uh, the, you have grief rituals from like the Smithsonian Institute the, as a, um, the virtual Dia de los Muertos, uh, where they were able to create memorials for uh, loved ones who had passed. Um, you have higher education, so they have these conferences that you can go to um, and actually be immersed into these different conferences uh, with these different uh, VR spaces and um, Social, uh, virtual world spaces, we have workplace telepresence. So being at work and being able to actually be embodied, but also have these uh, avatar representations here. Um, you have uh, hanging out with your friends and, and experiences like rec room, and then uh, combating isolation uh, for folks who have different accessibility or they feel like they're they're exiled in some fashion. So that's sort of a, a quick run through uh, for each of those. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be uh, I've I've given a talk before on both the ethics that goes through as a as a using this as a framework, but also 
the ultimate potential of VR. And I'll be kind of like hitting that as well to kind of help you imagine, um, you know, how each of these contexts start to play out. Uh, just a, a quick note, also the um, virtual reality allows you to completely switch context and augmented reality, you're in an existing center of gravity of an existing context, but you're, you're combining other, other contexts on top of wherever you're at. And so I may be at home, but go into a, a, a work meeting, but I may be out and about and wanting to kind of have a uh, work call or be able to get um, information about, um, you know, uh, buying something or um, additional peripheral information as I'm out and about. And so you have ways that I'm modulating my existing context. So we're going to be kind of uh, contextually aware computing is actually going to be a big uh, thing in the future. Uh, Facebook says that they want to be able to have an AI that's recording egocentric data capture that's basically capturing everything you say or do, everything you're looking at, in order to use AI to basically hard code uh, the detection of what context you're in. Context is really strange and weird, though, because I could be sitting here and all of a sudden I start talking about my wife or my family, and that's a context switch. Um, and so you know, moving from one context to another is very fluid in a lot of ways. So it's something that's very difficult to determine, but um, having computing technologies that are able to detect what your existing context is and be able to respect, respond to contextually relevant information could be a, a useful uh, thing. I don't know if it's worth the privacy costs, but uh, either way, we're, we're living into a future that's gonna be much more con contextually aware. Uh, so this was uh, from Laval Virtual, where we had a whole bunch of different uh, ethical issues, and we started to map out into this cartography. Um, and I've got some other talks where I dive in much deeper detail, the XR Ethics Manifesto, and then uh, the talk that I gave recently that I sent along about the IEEE XR Ethics, um, and uh, also a talk at AWE. Uh, that's like a whole like two hours worth of content that could go on and on and on. Uh, but I'm just going to briefly go back to this you know, how the context here I'm setting up again is to these two dialectics between self and other uh, and then private and public. Again, there's no existing like comprehensive framework for all of human context. And by its very nature, it's gonna be inconsistent and incomplete, uh, both. There's gonna be weird inconsistencies, uh, but I find that this is a, a useful tool to be able to start to think about and talk about some of these different issues. Um, so even though it's imperfect, it's still, it's useful, I find it. Okay, so here's the different domains of human experience in this context. I'm gonna just go to go through and kind of give what uh, is kind of an accelerated talk of what, what you can think of as like kind of the ultimate potential of VR. Okay, so um, if you look through all the different college majors, uh, you can sort of break it up into like uh, pioneers, early adopters, early majorities. Uh, so the folks that are really on the cutting edge of adopting it into green uh, and the yellow, they're kind of in the middle, and these are the laggards ones are probably take a little while for them to really integrate all the different aspects of VR. Um, and if you uh, think about these different phases of like the innovators, early adopters, early majority, late majority laggards. So crossing the chasm is like when it goes from kind of a niche thing into kind of breaking into the mainstream. VR is, you know, on the cusp of doing this within the next couple of years, potentially even in, even in 2021. We'll see. Uh, but once it starts to have the exponential growth, then it just has these network effects where it just you know, it goes viral essentially. Um, but the folks that are like on the bleeding edge are the innovators and then the early adopters. Uh, and then the, the folks who are the early market, those are the early majority. Uh, so taking that same kind of model and looking at these different disciplines and you can kind of see how, you know, art and design, performance arts, you know, there's a lot of what's happening in entertainment that's happening, uh, medical, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening in medical and also just some higher, uh, like, uh, education in terms of like biology and chemistry, computer science, there's things in which that it, it really has some, some real benefits for being able to do uh, data visualizations and whatnot. Also education, communications and architecture. Uh, so other than that, there's a lot of um, area for growth in all these areas, but this is kind of where VR is starting in these specific contexts uh, in medical health and entertainment uh, and in uh, uh, training, higher education and training. Uh, and there's some also a uh, government uh, and uh, telepresence Telepresence is probably another one here in terms of communication. All right, now this is a big <laughs> eyesore of a, uh, uh, a I, this is from my XR Ethics Manifesto. And then I digested this into a talk that I gave kind of summarizing it. Uh, currently I'm a part of the IEEE's doing a whole, um, uh, what's it called? The IEEE Global Initiatives on the Ethics of Extended Reality. I'm helping to kind of come up with a lot of the 
the, the white paper. So this is kind of my provocation as a starting point to kind of map out the different ethical dilemmas. Uh, this isn't in a slide and also in a video that you can take a look at later. Um, but, uh, and I've covered it also in other videos, but going back here, let's sort of go through these different contexts. So uh, identity, self identity, biometric data. So this is your uh, expression of your identity, having these avatar representation, what's it mean to be able to uh, embody all these different avatars, your biometric data, what's that able to give information about you uh, and be able to potentially even radiate that out to other people. You have the ability to, to hack your consciousness uh, and biofeedback sensory uh, immersion vehicle where you actually have this haptic input that's being um, and your bio uh, biofeedback information being fed into an experience in real time. So it has like this, uh, this closed loop of being able to actually kind of like modulate your consciousness and these closed feedback loop cycles. So this is the, the send sync from Adam Ghazali. Um, and then you have brain controlled interfaces and neural inputs, uh, all the different ways in which that you have these peripheral technologies to be able to tap into our muscles and our, our brain waves and being able to actually move uh, content with our minds. Um, and potentially even, you know, with these uh, direct neural injection, that's sort of more speculative at this point, uh, more invasive BCIs, but even what you can do with a non-invasive, pretty impressive. Uh, haptic suits and gloves, so all of your sensory experience of uh, different peripherals that you have here. Um, the sensory substitution, so being able to actually replace senses um, by having a haptic vest that is able to uh, train your brain to be able to listen to these uh, patterns that's translating sound from the environment and to kind of turn your torso into an ear. Uh, so replacing sound, uh, be able to give you yourself hearing if you are deaf and you can't hear, doing stuff like sensory substitution or even sensory addition, being able to add new senses to your, your um, sensory input, uh, and then self-sovereign identity. Uh, and verified identities, I think, is going to be a big thing, either through self-sovereign identity or other ways that you're able to verify that this is actually you and not some sort of deep fake. Uh, and also the, the fashion shows, uh, being able to actually kind of show off all your different clothing uh, and what's it mean to have virtual fashion. All right, um, moving on to resources, money, values, you have um, these are all the ways that you have virtual currencies and virtual goods, uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, also, the new uh, economic dynamics because uh, you don't have the same supply and demand, supply uh, and demand dimension. So you can actually have these gifting economies um, and uh, find other ways of, of sustaining it, whether it's through gifting or uh, Patreon or NFTs or whatever that ends up being. Uh, surveillance capitalism is a big issue in terms of all this data and how. Uh, these companies are actually paying for it uh, through our, our data. Um, and then the virtual gift economies, um, you know, any land, uh, different dynamics where it, you can basically clone all these different virtual objects. Um, the selling of different uh, crypto art NFTs, uh, that's really been exploding here the last uh, couple of months or so. Uh, merchandise stores at Roblox, uh, I know Little Nas X, as well as the Fortnite concert, millions of dollars of being sold in these different um, special avatars and clothing. Uh, for these special events. Um, and then uh, should we own our own data? Uh, right now, it's basically like a lot of colonizing companies that are coming in owning that data, but to what degree are we going to be able to own our own data? Uh, and then what's it going to look like to be able to walk around with all these different, um, you know, hyper-reality from Keichi Matsuda is a good depiction to, you know, talk about the different ethics of uh, advertising as you're walking around and sensory overload. Um, so that's the money uh, resources and the uh, virtual goods. Uh, and values. Uh, moving on to the uh, the third one here, early education communication. This is everything from uh, being able to have telepresence and communicating and early education and, um, you know, doing different things in Minecraft and memory palaces and uh, telepresence applications, um, data visualizations and spatial language, um, natural language processing. So being able to, to speak and have your voice be a conversational input, uh, metaphor communication. So all sorts of ways of uh, turning into like dream logic and, and cultivating, just like we have memes or kind of like this metaphoric dream logic where if you imagine looking at a lot of the meme discourse that happens right now, uh, and you like imagine looking at that like 10 years ago and you'd be just completely lost. Uh, so there's ways in which that there's shared uh, symbols in the culture that are at a, a hyper rate of being created. So what's it mean to live in a world where there's all these symbol symbolic and metaphor communication that's happening, uh, spatialized emojis, uh, is a big way of communicating and sharing your emotions. Um, uh, so that's the early education and communication, uh, a home and family and private property. Uh, so this is just connecting to your, your home and family and all what are the different privacy implications of having uh, spatially scanning uh, your, your home, like in volumetric memories, 
uh, being able to, to recreate your childhood homes, um, spatial mapping through the computer vision and uh, where does that data go, who has access to it. Uh, and then you have the uh, architecture and just the actual building of these different spaces and being connected to the earth in different ways. Uh, the sci-fi world building to really um, dream into a future that doesn't exist. Um, so then we have entertainment, hobbies, and sex. Uh, so everything from entertainment, immersive storytelling, uh, the holodeck. Um, the flow states is a big thing with this in terms of you really uh, uh, being able to be challenged uh, and also uh, reach these, uh, you have high ability, but the, the challenges are just at or above your ability, allowing you to achieve these flow states. Um, and be able to do different creativity and art, um, have these virtual concerts and adult entertainment, obviously, uh, which not only is just gonna exist as porn, but also in terms of content moderation, what's it mean to, to have any of these different virtual worlds uh, and making it safe for kids uh, and uh, just ensuring that there's a, just porn that's not just being uh, spammed across these different virtual networks and so different content moderation strategies. Okay, the next uh, context is the medical and health. So you have medicine, you have uh, the ways in which we're gonna be able to hack our, our brain with neuroplasticity, uh, the ownership of our health, um, telemedicine and being able to heal trauma, but also potentially cause trauma. So lots of ways in which that VR could uh, be causing different, um, uh, you know, if people have like epilepsy or uh, different dissociative disorders that folks need to be aware of. So, you know, just, just being able to be aware of what the research is and uh, as designers, knowing what the responsibilities are as designers, uh, and seeing all the different uh, existing uh, medical applications. Medical applications are actually a really interesting way to see like the cutting edge of biometric data and how it's really used for a, a beneficial cause that's gonna be helpful for your health and healing. Um, certainly there's gonna be some, some non-pro-social use for biometric data when it comes to, uh, if that data gets into the wrong hands, but certainly a lot of really great applications for medical applications. Okay, so the other partnerships is interesting because here you have the, the, the self and here's the other. So other could be everything from your romantic partner, but it could also be like an enemy, uh, someone who's trying to aggressively attack you in some way. So um, here you're just uh, kind of like this, um, uh, either a uh, romantic partner or uh, someone who's trying to uh, get at you. So you have everything from virtual harassment uh, to virtual being influencers. And so these uh, AI, non-player characters and virtual avatars that are anthropomorphized. And so what's the what's it mean to have these AI characters that are trying to influence us in different ways? Uh, you have deep fakes. And so people are trying to steal your identity. Um, you have the empathy of trying to empathize with the other uh, and different aspects of truth and reconciliation, uh, going on to virtual dates and being able to actually spend uh, quality time with loved ones within VR worlds. Um, something that's still uh, at the very early phases, but I'm sure will definitely be a thing just like going on dates in real life is a thing. Uh, next is death and collective resources. This is a lot about um, everything from recreating uh, deceased children, uh, so resurrecting people within VR. What are the ethics of that? And uh, Zoom funerals and um, uh, being able to, um, you know, what are, what are the rituals that we have for uh, honoring the dead? Um, the grief rituals. And so uh, dealing with grief, um, uh, homestay is a great example of that. Uh, the Dia de los Mortos from the, the Smithsonian Museum, um, you know, they're, they don't have an actual physical location. So this is their only, uh, they, they do a lot of innovation when it comes to doing these types of virtual events. Uh, the image rights after death, um, you know, virtual violence, bans and, suspic uh, bans and suspicion, suspensions. And so, you know, uh, what are the protocols around that? Uh, permanent bans and temporary suspensions. Uh, then we have uh, philosophy, higher education, law. Um, so yeah, a big thing is like breaking down these different academic silos. Uh, that's just a interdisciplinary collaboration is a big theme with NVR. But you also have like skill acquisition, be able to actually train uh, different people, everything from the military to, uh, uh, but also just from Walmart workers and everything else. Uh, so higher education, going to conferences and being able to complex uh, complexity through these data visualizations. Um, uh, and you know, capturing these deep patterns within AI, you know, data science is a machinic Neoplatonism. So really tapping into the underlying structure of reality and being able to really have an embodied experience of some of these different patterns in an interactive way, I think is really exciting. Uh, virtual travel, uh, being able to sort of see the world um, and then invoking these states of wonder and awe uh, and, you know, just feeling like you're going into another realm with this surreal dreamlike spaces. Uh, so uh, last three here, government, 
uh, and the uh, career institutions. Um, so this is everything from like workplace telepresence and to like virtual screens for productivity and uh, using it for different professional use cases at work. Um, and then friends, community, collective culture. This is everything from your community, uh, different aspects of hanging out with your friends and making sure that uh, all the different algorithms that you're using are not having any sort of undue algorithmic bias. And so really taking into consideration different aspects of diversity and inclusion, as well as avatar representation, having a diversity there as well. Uh, but there's a sort of implicit social scores that happen within these that, that do these rankings. So what happens to those numbers? Where do they go? Um, and then the final one here is the hidden, exiled, and accessibility. So this is everything from uh, folks who are uh, in a nursing home who may not have access to the outside world and feel exiled in some ways, uh, folks who are exiled in prison who don't have access, uh, everything to uh, if you don't have uh, all of your uh, fully able-bodied uh, then there's ways that that could cut you off to different aspects of society. So how can VR um, help either close some of those gaps or at least not make those gaps worse by creating VR te technology that is not accessible? So it's a big ethical issue to figure out how to actually do that. Uh, and then, you know, kind of like, what's it mean to be able to have uh, these XR uh, experiences that you get totally distract distracted and completely escapist and, you know, some people actually walk off of at cliff is, cliffs and, um, you know, just aren't really paying attention to the world around them. So that was a sort of a uh, the uh, an overview of all these different domains of uh, human experience here. Uh, and uh, you know, if I go back to uh, this here, I think you start to see there's a lot of dis different similarities. You know, um, this is actually kind of getting into some very specific technologies like cybernetics and augmentation. But it's the same type of idea where you're trying to break up. Uh, all of society into these different contexts and then trying to kind of project out these trajectories kind of like what i did here was a little bit of a, a world building exercise but then you know usually with world building you pick a time and place and then you start to dream and imagine with a community coming together all the different stakeholders having lots of different stakeholders and lots of different perspectives lots of different experts uh, then you start to actually build these worlds and come up with a plan and then actually implement them uh, either in a story or uh, in potentially even a immersive virtual reality experience with architecture. Uh, and then when people see that, then there's been a lot of amazing stuff with seeing these things be built in a virtual space, then actually getting implemented over uh, long periods of time from these communities that are highly polarized, but find ways that this process can actually bring them together. So that's the, uh, the context and world building. And I'll, I'll pause now to see if there's uh, any other questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, try to get through these next couple of sections here, uh, probably in the next 10, 15 minutes and just leave the rest of the time, uh, 20 minutes or so, or, or however long y'all want to hang out. I'll be happy to, to stay around and answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> um, so let's go back to these, uh, the, the four dimensions of experience. We talked about the quality. We talked about the context. Now let's talk about the character. So uh, this is a Robert McKee quote that says the True character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. So what this is saying is that when you're watching a film and you're watching a character make choices, those choices that they're making under pressure is somehow revealing an essential part of their own character. The exciting thing about immersive experiences is that you are the one who are actually making the choices. So you have the potential to be potentially revealing a part of your character. The caveat here is that this is a simulated arbitrary context. The degree to which that your behavior is gonna be representative of what the context actually would be if you're in that situation is uh, open to debate. I think some cases, uh, there's a pretty good one-to-one -one translation where you would pretty much act the same, but others you say, oh, it's just a game. You would probably do things that you would never do in real life, especially if you, uh, you, know, you have a, uh, you know, a, 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 an experience where you could kill other people or whatnot. So there's different ways in which the stakes are definitely different. But the exciting thing is that we have like a, an infinite multitude of different contexts that you could put people through to be able to see what their essential nature is in that arbitrary context. So that's one way that I think about character is that it's revealing a part of like your essential part of who you are. So there's lots of ways to be able to get at that. And there's no, again, no one way. But uh, again, here, you're a protagonist placed within the context with pressure. So here you have, we are in some context and here you have sort of the hero's journeys of this process that's unfolding. You're making choices and then taking action. 
and then some part of your essential character is being revealed. Okay. So uh, there's lots of different ways to think about this, whether it's from a Jungian perspective of the conscious, the unconscious, uh, or you know, moral virtue uh, is something that the, the philosophers of ancient Greek talked a lot about from courage, temperaments, generosity, magnificence. Um, you know, this right here is actually using Westworld. They have their own way of, of talking about character. Um, character and AI, this is gonna be a thing. Like, how do you describe the essential character? What's it mean to like, what kind of choices they make? What's that say about their essential personality? Uh, so you have a virtue continuum as another way to start to look at this, these uh, kind of more of a dialectical approach uh, of, you know, one extreme or the other. Uh, again, this is the, the thing from Westworld, uh, just a data visualization that they use for their characters. Um, uh, you have the different temperament. So uh, just like there's a hot, cold, wet, dry, this goes to choleric, phlegmatic, sanguine, and melancholic, which is something that the, the Waldorf School actually uses for their, kid, for their students to start to for the teachers to at least have uh, another level of access to try to see if their their temperament is connected to their learning style. It's not, it's not always uh, the case, but you know at least um, there's a, it's a, a heuristic that could help um, you know determine what someone might be predisposed to. Even if you talk to someone and they're super into like first person shooters and running around, maybe they'll like you know a game with a lot of locomotion and exploration, and you can kind of from there try to match their temperamental preferences with games that may be uh, exhibiting that type of temperament. Trying to match people with an experience that's gonna match their temperament is like a, one of the grand challenges of experiential design. There's also the big five personality characteristics that you could use. There's the feelings and the needs that I talked about earlier. Um, so again, the protagonist, you're placed in a, in a context, uh, put under pressure, you're making choices and taking action. And then from that, you're revealing some part of your character and how you measure that and how you make sense of that and how that changes over time is a big part of uh, how you do this different experiential, experiential design. One experience to, to look at, uh, which um, is called the Collider, which they were really looking at the dialectic between power um, and control. And so what degree have other people had power over you or you had over power over other people? And what degree have you been good about maintaining good boundaries around that power? So those are two kind of like aspects of a, a character trait about your own relationships to power or your own relationships to, to uh, boundaries um, that uh, could be revealed in an experience like that. Even if it is a contrived experience, you could still be getting to a, a true part of your character. All right, so that's the character. Uh, and I'm just gonna go through these, these last sections here just to kind of you know, finish it up and open it up for the broader discussion. Okay, so the, four, the, the last dimension of the experience is the story. So we have the quality, context, character, and the story. Okay, so the story is, you know, the way in which that something is unfolding in a process. What's changing? It's the beginning, middle, and end. What is beginning? What's the middle? And what's the end? Um, so Joseph Campbell's in Hero's Journey has a good framework for having you're in the mundane world, you cross the threshold, you have some sort of ordeal, you're able to successfully, you know, conquer your, your enemy, and then you come back with some sort of treasure that you share back to the rest of the community. And so it's these three basic phases and you know actually breaks into lots of little sub phases but those are the three main you you have a call to adventure you go have some ordeal and then you come back to the return uh, so again it's like the six the cycle that you're you're building some tension and releasing it dan Harmon has his own story circle where he starts to talk about the same type of thing uh same same dynamic uh, building and releasing of that tension going from order to chaos and back to order again um now this is a from Alex McDowell. Uh, he uh, has a really interesting slide where he talks about the history of storytelling, where he says, you know, back in the old days, we used to like tell stories around the campfire, and we actually be very collaborative, and people would like start to, you know, jump in, or there wasn't like a canonical version of the story. It would it would be a living story. It would grow and adapt and change with the culture. That's why when you look at the myths uh, mythology, there's not like one version, although, you know, a lot of academics uh, do end up having those canonical versions. But at the time, that's not what would happen. It was evolving and changing with the culture itself. And then once the printing press came, then everything got linearized and uh, into these canonical versions. And I think we're moving, this is the, the argument that McDowell's making, and I totally agree, is we're moving back into this more kind of non-linear, spatial-oriented, oral history, evolving stuff that's emergent, Right now, it's participatory. You can actually be a part of the story as it's unfolding. You're not just a passive spectator. So all these things are there's parts of which that the way that culture and music was created in the past, we're kind of coming back to a lot of those same different aspects where it's not just about you buying 
uh, that, but you could, you know, Clubhouse is probably a good example where it's just an emergent conversation right now. It's meant to be ephemeral. It's not meant to be archived and recorded and shared. It's meant to be fully participatory with everybody that's there and kind of emergent based upon whoever shows up. So the story authorship, uh, kind of just quickly going through here, um, from the authored narrative to generative narrative. And I talked about this a little bit earlier where it's a spectrum of authorship. Either you have no agency or impact on the story or you have like the maximized agency. Of course, you can never have like total agency. I mean, that's a philosophical question as to whether or not to the degree to which that we have free will. Um, you know, so that's a, there's a hard limit at some uh, point at which that this is what you're able to uh, codify within the, either the simulation or the rules of the game and based on, uh, you know, other people that are participating in there. But there's, there is going to be a limit of how much will that you're able to experience, but there's some degree that which that when you maximize it, it's much more about the generative narrative. The narrative is emergent. It's not ne necessarily fixed in some sort of fixed time frame. Um, so uh, Lebowitz and Klug has a really uh, good um, interactive storytelling spectrum where they have uh, from author to generative, they have fully traditional stories, interactive uh, traditional stories, multiple endings, branching path, open-ended and fully player driven. And I'll quickly go through kind of the, the structure here to kind of elaborate just a little bit. So the linear is the, all the structure that we're completely familiar with, with the sort of Aristotelian three act structure um, where you have the, the climax and then the, you know, the ascending action and descending action. So then when you start to get the interactive traditional story, you're giving the user a little bit of agency, but not really that much. You're kind of, it's like a illusionary. It's like a, you're flavoring, but you're not really actually giving them a choice to really change anything. Um, they, they have a different, you know, a, a flavor, I'd say. They, it's, but it's a, the same, for, at the end of the day, you come up to the same ending. And then you have the branching path stories, which this is like in the middle point where it's both at the same time exponentially difficult for the authors to author all these different stories and make them compelling. But also as you go through it, uh, you may go through it once and then there may be lots of work that went into creating all these other uh, really uh, engaging narratives. And you may not even know that it's a branching path narrative. Um, so it's kind of a dilemma here of yeah, trying to make people aware and then what, how do you go back and experience other ones? Um, so uh, Bandersnatch is an example where there's different ways of kind of like getting people through all the different paths that they want to go through. Uh, and then you get into the interactive drama manager. This is from like a, a game like Facade where you're, you're uh, coming up with all these different dialogue pairs and then it's unfolding over this specific arc, but it's based upon your actions. So it's paying attention to what you're doing. And then based upon your actions, it's feeding you the best narrative that it possibly can based upon your state that you're in at that moment. And so it's it's much more trying to to use the traditional storytelling conceits, but really be dynamically interactive to uh, what you're doing. This is probably one of the most uh, complicated and uh, like interactive narratives up still to this day, and it and it came out you know back in like you know 2000s 2002. So open-ended stories. This is where you start to have a little bit more object-oriented, where you have these entities and these objects that are in relationship to each other. But um, you know back here you start to have a little bit more of moving more towards your agency. So here you're really more about exploration and play and interactivity. It's, it's harder to have a really compelling uh, narrative because it's more about you expressing your will at this point rather than uh, having the time-based control of the narrative that's unfolding. And then finally, this kind of fully player-driven stories is kind of like this probability space where there's gonna be certain things that are possible uh, and the AI characters have like kind of high level personality characteristics, but their interactions are very emergent based upon like, you know, you can think of just like Westworld uh, when you go into Westworld and you're able to do all these different things based upon the narratives that they've written. So there are some guardrails, of course, because it's a simulation, but you're trying to maximize the degree of your agency here. All right, so th that's kind of like a spectrum of the storytelling. And I think this is, you know, when we think about all these other different design disciplines, these different conceits of storytelling will have to be sort of melded in to, to what degree, where do you fall in on the spectrum? Uh, this is sort of like every interactive narrative has to make this choice as to where they're going to end up. Um, and it, depending on um, whose character is being revealed based upon the agency, if you're just watching like a, a, a film, the, the character that's being revealed is the character of an event, person, place, or culture, or you know, it's, it's the person that's being featured in the film. But the ideal, once you get to the generative narrative, is that your character is being revealed. Uh, so what's that mean to be able to create experiences that are revealing someone's essential character to themselves? 
All right. So are you a ghost or embodied character? Uh, and do you have impact? So this is just like a two prong. So either you're a ghost, um, without impact, like, uh, you know, a sleep no more where you're just observing like a ghost, um, in the background or you're addressed as a character. So they're talking to you, but you can't do anything. So you're kind of disabled in some fashion. You can't actually interact, but you're being addressed as if you are a character. So, um, so you have some sense of being a part of the experience, but not really, or you're a complete ghost that's able to control things, or you're, you know, the essence here of the live action role play where you're a character that actually had the choices that you're making is changing the way that the story is unfolding. Okay, so that's the story. And I'm just going to quickly, uh, I'm gonna pause there actually, and see if there's any questions. So coming back to, so this is the tech architecture and evolution. So, We've talked a lot about the uh, the four qualities experience, which is really looking at the lens of, um, say, like the cultural norms, the, the direct phenomenological experience of the technology. I'm just going to talk briefly about the technological architecture and the code, uh, just because I think it's uh, important to kind of have at least some framework for understanding how technology develops, how it disseminates out into culture. Because um, I think you know this is basically what's happening right now is that we're we're having all these new technologies that's getting out there, and at some point it's going to hit a critical mass, and like everybody's going to be doing it. At least that's what I suspect based upon precedent. Um, so again, you have the new technology, people are doing new things with that technology, you have the distribution channels, and then audiences are uh, being able to watch it and give feedback. This is like what I see as the essential loop of a communications medium. Uh, there can be additional things in there in terms of filtering and um, you know curation and influencers and whatnot, but this is like the, the core essence of what I think is the minimum viable communication medium to really get a communication medium going. And because WebXR has been uh, stifled because of the uh, Safari as an example has not fully implemented the WebXR spec, it's really held back the full distribution. So people are not willing to invest in it until it has full buy-in from like a company like Apple. Once Apple distributes it, then WebXR will really take off because it will have fully robust distribution channels. But up to this point, it's kind of been stifled because of that. So you can use something like this to kind of understand where the overall market is at. So we talked about this kind of like hierarchy from the, the culture, laws, economy, and you know, putting at the core of the baseline is the culture. Um, so you can sort of see how uh, you know, the technological architecture and the code is influencing all these things, but also it's within the context of the economy. That economy is within the context of different laws of what is and is not possible. And those laws are within a context of the culture. So to what degree we'll have privacy laws that really depends upon the culture influencing the, the lawmakers that then will eventually those laws will impact the technological architecture and the code. So it's kind of like a flow down, but also the technology architecture and the code also has impact on both the economy and the laws and the culture. So it's actually more of a, you know, kind of a feedback loop on both directional to bi-directional. But if I were to kind of pick one uh, version, this is what I would say, just to kind of help conceive of that. Um, so this is just looking over the past 100 years, 120 years of how electricity, automobiles, clothes washers, you know, you have this um, uh, cumulative adoption here, like up to 100% where, you know, you have, you know, uh, automobiles here and that this probably is going down, uh, air conditioning and, you know, power. So electricity and all of these things are kind of like over time, they follow this kind of S curve. Um, so this S curve here, um, Simon Wordley has a really helpful model where he says, there's the genesis, custom built, the product, and the commodity. Um, so these these are distinct different phases that you go through. So the, you initially have a prototype and a genesis, then you get to a custom bespoke um, enterprise application, and then you go from here into the uh, consumer product and then the, in, into the ubiquitous commodity. One of the challenges of, say, uh, Magic Leap was they tried to skip over this custom built enterprise app, and they said, oh, we're just going to have this like $3,500 consumer product but not have any content for it. Um, so you can see how like they might, then they eventually pivoted over to the enterprise, but they probably would have been better served to start with the enterprise in order, if that's the price point they're at, to really kind of seed it there where they can really sustain that. And then eventually once they reach the economies of scale, move on to the consumer product, which is kind of what uh, Oculus is doing. Although they are subsidizing it heavily with their own billions of dollars to be able to kind of jump into the consumer product probably earlier than it's really ready for, but that's kind of where we're at. All right, so we have these four different phases, uh, Genesis custom built product and commodity. So you can th think of it as this is the ways in which that the technology is going through different phases of getting out into the world. Um, 
So you have the initial prototype of sort of Democlues in 1968, and then you have the, the custom bespoke enterprise apps in the, in the 90s with the VPL. And then you have all of these consumer VR headsets from 2012 to 2019. The, this is the consumer market here. Uh, and then uh, eventually, at some point, it may reach the ubiquitous commodity. Um, it's arguable that we're not quite there yet with smartphones, just because there are differences between iPhone and iOS and, and Android. Um, you know, a commodity is like uh, electricity and uh, gasoline. You don't care. There's literally no difference between any of it. Um, so eventually, it's it's debatable as as to whether or not these ecosystems reach that point. You could argue that there's enough value that the iOS uh, ecosystem has that it's going to maintain that kind of consumer product. But eventually, we want to get to the point where it is just a commodity. It doesn't matter. It, it's just you can interchange and do whatever app, just like you can on PCs. Well, for the most part, you know, there's PC versus Mac, but kind of like have these XR as an open platform is where eventually it is going to be headed. So this is, again, uh, these, these three phases, super helpful. And he, he makes a differentiation between the evolution versus the diffusion. So the evolution of those different phases, the, uh, that sort of maturity of going to these different points of like that it's ready to go from the uh, custom built bespoke handcrafted into the consumer product. Um, but it also iterates uh, through each of these different uh, permutations with all these different versions of VR from 2013 to 2020. Um, and you see each version kind of reaches its own 100% penetration, and then it goes on to the next one. Um, so you, you, each iteration has its new wave of diffusion. Uh, and then that kind of gets mapped to the Everett's diffusion curve. And then you sort of get back to this crossing the chasm in the mainstream, which VR is kind of hovering in this area now. Uh, which within the next couple of years it go, could go, you know, from the scale of like five million up to the, you know, ten to twenty million. It's doubling each year, and as it, as it doubles each year, then eventually it gets to the point where it just kind of hits a critical mass. It could be until twenty twenty five. No one really, really knows. There's, I mean, the pandemic has already accelerated it uh, up to this point, so there's really no telling what's going to happen from now until twenty twenty five or twenty forty. Um, but uh, yeah, just uh, these are just more ways. Um, we're going to quickly just sort of talk about this. This, this gets into another mapping thing. Um, you can see that there's these different phases, but what's helpful about these uh, Wordly maps is that he's able to kind of map the value chain across these different things. So here's an example of a photo website where you could see like the commodity, here's the power and all the data center and the cloud computing. And then eventually their platform is gonna be commoditized into the cloud and they, they're they paying for CRMs. And these are all the different ways in which they they pay for like a website, like say a Squarespace or WordPress or whatnot, or you're paying for a CRM. This here, this custom built stuff and the Genesis, the stuff that you're building, that is what makes uh, a, a company unique because this is the secret sauce that no one else has yet. And then all of the technology is eventually moving over into like as competition arises, then it moves down uh, over to the right and also down. Things become like a commodity. So things get open sourced, like, you know, Tilt Brush got open sourced. So that sort of commodifies the artistic creation in a certain way. And it could accelerate other things that are being able to be built upon that. So this is a, a really helpful way to kind of map out just the overall ecosystem and to see what degree of like, Avatar creation. Well, there's an open standard for that now. So now that's going to be an accelerator that starts to move things into um, having new network effects based upon having interoperable uh, avatars, as an example. And there's also ways in which that uh, the town plant, there's like phases here. So the, the early adopters are the people who are like the pioneers. They always want to be like in the, the leading edge stuff, the stuff that the, the tinkerers, they're, they're okay with stuff being buggy. And they just want to, they want to do the absolute newest thing all the time. Uh, and then you have the settlers who are like more about trying to build out what has been pioneered into like an actual like settlement. Not, it, unfortunately, they're using a lot of settler colonial uh, metaphors here. But the, the point is just that there uh, there's people who are kind of the builders at, at a point where it's less variance. It's, it's more certain that uh, what the affordance is of. This is like on the hype cycle uh, once it goes into the plateau of, of productivity. And the, the town planners, these are all the DevOps and the people who are just keeping the lights on um, and all the stuff that's very important to be done, but it's not like cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff um, happening all the time. It's more settled down here. 
So you can see that any web application is going to be a, a combination of these different um, aspects. Um, and there's different accelerators that move things, like going open source moves things over. And then there's uh, ways in which uh, patents may block uh, some some of this from going over. So there's different ways that inertia is blocked or inertia is. Uh, so I really like these uh, maps and these approaches because it really takes like a process orientation. And this is just another way of looking at the Gartner hype cycle. Um, and you know what Neil Trevitt said is that every successful open standard has a proprietary competitor. So there's kind of an inherent sort of competitive, uh, uh, cooperative and competitive aspect where you really need both of them. And they actually make each other better when they have both an open standard and a proprietary competitor. So it's not necessarily bad that there's wall gardens. We just eventually need to have these open alternatives uh, to be able to have this kind of uh, com uh, competitive dialectic between them. Uh, again, the Hegelian dialectic we talked about earlier, very much in play here and sort of driving that that uh, closed uh, versus open. And again, you know, sort of the competition, cooperation, different ways in which that you have these dialectics that are playing out uh, across whether you you go for one end or the other for whatever you end up doing. All right. Well, that the final section here, I'm probably just going to blaze through it really quick just because it's basically just a lot of graphs. The design trade-offs. Um, I went through when one of my talks that I gave before, uh, just tried to go through all the different ways in which that say for all the embodied presence, what are all the different dialectics? And so you have everything from distribution, mobile PC, location-based or enterprise, um, or the scale of it tabletop scale or giant scale, or what type of volumetric capture are you using? Is it like mobile capture or digital light fields or computer generated, um, or CGI, you know, each of these are decisions that you have to make. Um, as you're like deciding, are you using voxels or a point cloud, or are you doing like uh, 5D digital light fields? All of these have experiential impacts. Um, and this is my at least first take of saying, okay, this maps over to embodied. But again, this is sort of like, um, uh, I'd say very early days of just trying to like map out as experiential designers, these are just some of the different decisions that you have to make. Uh, spatialized audio, what kind of spatialized audio are you gonna do? Uh, audio sources, are they recorded or procedurally generated? Um, what kind of avatar embodiment are, are you going to have? If it's an LBE, if you have facial expression, all sorts of, all the way up to like biometric abstractions, um, haptic feedback, um, integrations, smell integrations, and EEG. And I'll probably make these slides available that if you want to really dig into these, um, you can sort of see, you know, biometric feedback and all these different things that are going to be a part of uh, VR and the different degrees of comfort. Um, there's a mixed reality spectrum, which end are you on from a real environment or VR environment? In active presence, you have the narrative agency, impact or no impact, locomotion, what type of locomotion do you have? Uh, can you see any traces of your agency? Um, and if you have no trace of your agency, then it's completely chaos. If you have, um, uh, well, either way, either extreme can be, um, you really wanna be in the sweet spot where you, you were able to see some of your uh, trace of your agency, but um, in a way that's unpredictable. That's kind of like in the middle is good there. Uh, is it reacting to your behavior or not? Um, different levels of abstractions, <clears throat> um, the mental and social presence, you have telepresence, uh, spectrum from phone to all the way to, from like talking on phone to the, it feels totally real to virtual beings, uh, to super intelligent virtual beings, to avatar fidelity, to what degree are you stylized or, you know, photorealistic and uh, to what degree can BCIs read your mind and read your attention and your motor intentions and your, your speech patterns and what your, your mind is thinking, your imagery. I mean, this is sort of speculative where things are going. Um, audience sizes here, uh, if there's a solo experience all the way up to like uh, uh, micro, uh, the Madison Square Garden sphere would have had 18,000, uh, but not quite sure if they're still gonna have that. And then finally, the emotional presence from like, to what degree are you a ghost or a character or are using literal or symbolic metaphors or you know, linear or cyclical time? <clears throat> is it, are you doing some level of really walking in someone's shoes or doing sort of a negative trauma tourism? Um, everything from having no emotional expression to like facial tracking and micro expressions to like doing some level of biometric abstraction of your emotions. Um, do you have things that are synchronized or not synchronized? So each of these have different degrees of dialectics um, uh, and the this I, I'd say uh, it's still at the very I mean this is just a 
early mappings, there's probably easier ways of like both presenting this and probably at the end of the day, it's probably better to have an immersive experience where you can actually see what it feels like to have these different decisions. I mean, I've done probably three to 5,000 experiences. Uh, and so I have my own intuitive sense of the differences of some of these, but even then it's very nuanced. And I think the end of the day, all of this is like modulating your consciousness to the point where you're able to really fine tune uh, how you change all these different inputs and to try to really uh, have this perfect combination of trying to uh, cultivate the different types of experiences that you want to be able to both, you know, uh, have the quality experience, the context of the experience, the, the story of the experience, uh, and the character of the experience, as well as, you know, understanding all the different dimensions of the dialectics and the polarities and the, all these different design disciplines are being fused together. Uh, and then, you know, finally sort of just thinking about the technology itself, how it's evolving and just thinking about these design trade-offs. So believe it or not, that's it. So. <laughs>